Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 37th webinar. It gives me immense pleasure that Professor Sumer Bichoma has agreed to speak on our forum, the Association of Indian Research Scholars, or AIRS. We have been active since September 2020, and we have successfully hosted eminent scholars, including Noam Chomsky, Professor Joseph Nye, Professor Hargopal, Professor Rajan Harshe, Professor Zoya Hassan, Professor Afroz Alam, Professor Mohammed Muazzam Ali, among many others. We have also released two newsletters, both of which included not just the webinar reports, but also opinion pieces by scholars from across India. If you have any piece you'd like to publish, do consider sending this to us on our mail. We are also available on all social media platforms. So connect with us, share, like, subscribe for updates and notifications. My name is Ivari Noklao, and I'm a PhD scholar at the Department of English at the University of Hyderabad. Let me introduce our speaker for you. Professor Sumya De Chamma teaches at the Center for Comparative Literature, University of Hyderabad. She is currently a professor and heads the center. Apart from teaching comparative Indian literature and cultural discourses in contemporary India, her research interests include literatures of India, translation studies, minority languages and cultural discourse, Kodava performative cultures. She joined the center in 2004 and prior to teaching in the University of Hyderabad, she taught English at Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. So, Mirde Chamba was uh, awarded the Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Excellence Fellowship for 2019. And during this Fulbright, she taught the course Modern Indian Literary Culture and conducted research on understanding the modern in Queen's College, City University of New York. Ma'am, on behalf of AIRS and also myself, I would like to thank you for your time here this evening. We look forward to your talk. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, I should thank Ariba and all of you at AIRS who uh, uh, very affectionately persuaded me to uh, do this talk. Uh, I, and I am also uh, very, very glad that some of you scholars have come together and formed this association of uh, uh, research scholars. I do think uh, uh, such an association is not just essential, but very much uh, required during these times and also at all times. Uh, to you, to your futures, uh, uh, I give my best. As uh, the title is circulated uh, before, so I have titled this talk as uh, to translation, we all belong comparatism, language, and ethnography. Although uh, um, uh, maybe the, uh, the talk is too kind of condensed in some places, I hope uh, there is a discussion uh, session where we could sort certain things out. Uh, I begin. I'll read from my uh, what I have written down and uh, uh, whenever required, I have a couple of slides uh, which I'll show. So here we go. What is comparative literature? I have been asked this question when I was interviewed for the post of assistant professor, for the post of associate professor, and also that of a professor. And not just on formal, very professional spaces like interviews, but I, and also all of us who are in comparative literature, face this question when we are with colleagues, when we are with friends, when we are with family, and pretty much this question is asked or rather hurled at us from everyone to whom we mention our discipline. And just for the sake of records, this question has been asked, what is comparative literature? This question has been asked, debated since at least the last two centuries. Despite the knowledge that the emergence and institutionalization of comparative literature as a discipline happened much earlier than most other disciplines as we know them today, and despite knowing that the nature and practice of all disciplines have changed enormously over the last 100 years, and 
despite understanding that our notions of knowledge itself has undergone drastic transformation over years right what is uh, knowledge what is a discipline what is it that we study what is a university all these notions have changed over time and it has changed drastically but then this question of what is comparative literature seems to be specific to disciplines like comparative literature and only i emphasize these questions are specific to certain disciplines only because they are interdisciplinary in nature and not just interdisciplinary in nature but they openly acknowledge themselves as belonging to an interdisciplinary web and also it is only because it would appear extremely amusing to ask what is english right what is english literature or what is kannada literature what is bangla literature these seem to be very evident too very obvious but unlike comparative literature whether be it formal informal albeit recognizing that english kannada bangla and all unitary lit literary disciplines have been undergoing changes uh, not just undergoing changes but what has constituted this disciplines itself has changed but then this question is quite specific to comparative literature right and this is not just in humanities but it's also true for all disciplines be it political science be it anthropology or sociology all these disciplines have changed but then asking such a question what is anthropology is very different from asking what is comparative literature so there are times when discussion with friends especially from the social sciences turn into heated debates what is the method of comparative literature what is the method that you guys follow this is another common question that we face of course the again the very evident answer is comparatism and i quote from s shankar comparatism customarily indicates scholarly comparison across linguistic and cultural boundaries recently arguments have advanced the notion of comparatism broadened to include comparison across genres media and similar categories of critical analysis end quote comparison needless to say is an established method means used not just in comparative literature but comparative philosophy uses it comparative politics uses it international relations uses it comparative theology uses it area studies uses it in fact pretty much all the disciplines use comparatism as a method even science right uh, where in sciences or in social sciences various factors and entities are put together data is collected and then data is studied to bring about a pattern to understand the pattern to understand commonality or dissimilarities and so on and so forth. so whether it is science or social sciences or humanities comparison is quite a common method across disciplines but it is only comparative literature which kind of openly acknowledges this uh, comparison which is a point which uh, professor sundar sarukai was making uh, just the other day in another talk right but then for many in the social sciences interdisciplinarity to openly acknowledge interdisciplinarity suggest a non rootedness right which means a method without a method of one's own so when you say sociology is interdisciplinarity it is shaken because it looks it implies that you do not have a method of your own but what is one's own does a method originally belong to any discipline and has a method remained unchanged unchanged how do we think about a sense of ownership of the practices of disciplines that almost almost amounts to territoriality to me comparative literature breaks this territoriality not just in its methods right in a very very common basic understanding of comparative literature is you use many languages you use many literatures you use different literatures different languages and different cultures right you study different languages you study different cultures you study different literatures and therefore by studying different languages itself it is breaking a territory in a very very fundamental sense but then 
uh, going uh, <coughs> to the history of uh, comparative literature, which you can see in the slide here, uh, early 19th century was a time when Europe was strife with national struggles. And it was also a time when there was a need to consolidate a national language, a national literature, a national culture, and a national history. So this process of uh, the making of a modern nation state, the national language, literature, and culture assumes a very, very central and significant uh, moment, right? So this consolidation of a national language via national uh, literature and culture also contradictorily at this moment was a time when the need for comparative literature came about, which cut across the narrowness of national literatures. So you have a time where you feel, especially when you read Goethe from Germany, where he openly talks about how Germany, which was divided into various uh, provinces, be it Bavaria, Prussia, and so on and so forth, had to come together as unified Germany. And in the making of this uni uh, unified Germany, German literature's part was very, very important, right? So Goethe himself is talking about the unified German literature. At the same time, Goethe is also articulating a narrowness of national literature that needs to be broken, right? There is a need to break away from the national literatures and move towards the idea of a world literature. So there is a war tone Europe. There is a need to uh, build a unified nation. And there is also a need felt to move across this unified nation. So you have politics, you have history, you have literature, you have everything working sometimes in contradiction and sometimes in a collaboration as well. So from Goethe onwards, we have this idea of interdisciplinarity, which as I just said, breaking boundaries, breaking national boundaries and also political boundaries, which is in Oak, right? And this is also actually uh, something which uh, Henry Remark, who is one of the early comparators uh, from America, who's talked about uh, comparative literature as a study of relationship between literature on one hand and other areas of knowledge and belief, such as the arts, the social science, philosophy, history, the sciences, religious, etc., etc. In brief, comparative literature is the comparison of one literature with another or others and the comparison of literature with other spheres of human expression. Now, <clears throat> how translation comes into being, I'll come into a little while. Uh, I also quote these interdisciplinarity. I also talk about this interdisciplinarity uh, uh, nature of uh, comparative literature also to locate my interdisciplinary training, my own personal individual interdisciplinary training which began in sciences and then English and then translation studies and then comparative literature that has constantly been enriched by and also enabled by my engagement with cultural studies, anthropology, gender studies and so on, right? So this movement in between among thoughts, among texts, among practices is of course translation at one level. So how do you move between cultures? How do you understand various cultures? How do you move between disciplines as well and practices as well? So this movement between texts and thoughts and practices can also be understood as translation at one level. And of course, this movement itself is interdisciplinary. And it is this interdisciplinary nature of our disciplines that I want to draw attention to beginning with the inseparable relationship between comparative literature and translation, a relationship both disciplines cannot do without, but as I will emphasize, uh, translation without which any discipline perhaps cannot do without. Uh, the interdisciplinarity of comparative literature, in fact, the interdisciplinarity of translation or the centrality of translation has come to us with a baggage that is quite burdensome to our histories. Right? Why burdensome? So we have a consolidation of uh, uh, national. Just a second, I'm just checking if this is the right slide. 
Okay, it's fine. So there is a consolidation of a national culture on the edifice on which most nations are built, right? There is a construction and homogenization of a particular literary history on which this national culture was imagined. So how was a national culture built? How was a unified, homogeneous national culture built? It is pretty much to a particular literary history. And how is this national literary history imagined and built? It is through a standardization of a particular dialect, right? Among the many dialects, among the many languages that are available in a region, a particular dialect is standardized pretty much translated into a textual national kind of a language and with on which on the basis of which a national literary culture is built right so there is also a constitution of a glorious national past that brought language literature culture and history together and all these realms that made the nation possible uh, essentially belong to the privilege now whose culture, right? Whose culture or whose language gets to be standardized as a national language? Which dialect gets to be standardized as a standard dialect of a particular region? So how are literary texts compiled together in order to build a national uh, literary culture? So it is this literary culture that essentially, in fact, very much interchangeable with national history. So national past based on a national literature is very much interchangeable also with the national history. And this, as I said, it essentially belongs to the realm of the privilege, which implies, which is an accepted the fact that these national literary cultures and national history are very selective, right? They choose certain things be it language, be it literature, be it translation, which, which one to translate, right? I'll come to the example of India very soon, and then we can see how this, uh, or how certain languages and certain cultures get to be constituted as national uh, um, language and come to be understood as Indian literature per se. So this happens through a very selective process where certain things are chosen and certain things are very conveniently erased, right? So these selective methods that make national literatures and make them possible are to be studied in juxtaposition to each other and the cultures to which they belong, thus making translation essential, but also making a national and comparative literature possible in very questionable ways. Right? Uh, I was just uh, uh, reading... Uh, a novel by uh, Ingrid Prasad, uh, the spelling is P-E-R-S-A-U-D. It's a novel from Trinidad. Uh, <clears throat> it's called Love After Love. Uh, so when I was reading uh, this, in fact, I was also thinking about this talk and I was wondering how do we understand the uh, position of Caribbean islands, the literature from Caribbean islands in the system of world literature or comparative literature, right? Do we understand a national literature of Tr Trinidad and Tobago? Or do we understand a national literature of West Indian islands? So how do we actually understand the history of these islands, these Caribbean islands? And do we actually, can we actually construct a national literature for them, right? Caribbean islands, which is a group of islands. So, in fact, in, to understand a literature of these Caribbean islands, obviously you'll have to understand its history. Now, what is the history of Caribbean islands where there are no quote-unquote natives at all, but the natives were totally wiped out by the white invasion, by the European invasion, and people who are now inhabitants of Caribbean literature are most people who were bought, uh, you know, who were bought there as uh, slaves or workers in the sugar plantation. There was one dialogue which really interested me. Uh, 
there's a cricket match happening and there are two uh, characters uh, uh, from trinidad both of them are from trinidad and uh, one person is uh, supporting uh, trinidad sorry west indian team and the other is supporting india so this is a dialogue uh, that goes on what happens to you i am supporting india but wait aren't you born here yes but we can trace our ancestors right back to the exact place in bihar they came from and therefore i support india so the other character says oh you mean you know which part your dirt poor relatives catch the boat to haul as halfway around the world for the opportunity to cut cane in this hot sun right so what essentially this character is saying is that whether it is four or five generations ago right your ancestors who found this quote unquote opportunity to get their ass up from bihar to travel halfway around to these islands to cut the cane in hot sun so in that kind of a history how do we locate this idea of a national history to a caribbean island a national literature to a caribbean island right and how do we understand this kind of politics so <clears throat> and where do we place literary stuff literary texts such as this within the canon of world literature itself which doesn't claim a nationality which is as uh, let's say uh, strongly challenged as uh, perhaps indian or chinese or sri lankan literature is right so that made me think about the problematics of how literature actually cannot uh, be divorced not just from translation but from history and politics as well which is something very 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 common understanding but it was just what i was reading uh, uh, recently so the making of comparative literature and the violent making of nation states it is a story that has been told quite a lot likewise the making of comparative literature and the strengthening of colonialism has also been told right now uh, <clears throat> like for example macaulay who compared english literature to trans comparative literature am i audible okay uh so macaulay's idea of uh, english literature arabic sanskrit persian a well known uh, uh, you know uh, uh, quote from uh, macaulay uh, so yeah so is it fine is it clear and continuous can i carry on it's clear and continuous uh, your slides are i think not changing can i carry on okay uh <clears throat> so what i was saying is that there is a certain way that these national literatures national cultures are translated right from what it is from a selective kind of a history selective kind of a language selective kind of a literature this selective nature of nationalized expressions are translated from a very very problematic kind of a platform so this idea right uh, that uh, all these things are quite a translation or is also related to the idea that questions the so called objectivity of social sciences because when you say translation is central not just to humanities but also to social sciences it also questions the objectivity right who is the translator here in social science who is the uh, who is it that is writing a field notes who is it that writing the ethnography right so by writing a particular person is translating and therefore that kind of an objectivity which is uh, supposed to belong to social sciences is also kind of tested right and this means that this binary of this objectivity and subjectivity that belongs to sciences social sciences and humanities 
has to be rethought um i quote from um, james clifford who uh, in his uh, on ethnographic authority uh, this is what he has to say on translation and cultural interpretation so if ethnography produces cultural interpretations through intense research experience how is unruly experience transformed into an authoritative written account right so ethnography we all agree is a very uh, uh unruly it's not a very uh, controlled kind of a experience you are part of a uh, society with all its day to day ramifications day to day unruliness day to day uncontrolled lives right so when there is an unruly experience in ethnography how is it transformed into an authoritative written account by the ethnographer how precisely is a garrulous over determined cross cultural encounter right remember cross cultural encounter because it's often an ethnographer who is an outsider who is encountering another uh, culture how is this garrulous cross cultural encounter shot through with power relations and personal cross purposes circumcised as an adequate version of a more or less discrete other world composed by an individual author right so whatever this individual ethnographer sees hears observes talks to a whole lot of uh, ethnographical experience how is it made into such a coherent writing of often ethnography by an individual author which represents a whole lot of different individuals belonging to a roughly uh, uniformized kind of a culture this writing includes minimally a translation of experience into textual form right so whatever it's not just the ethnographer but it also also an historian who reads various things who hears various things histories memories and so on pretty much like a, a ethnographer there is a whole lot of experience which is translated into a textual form written form this involves multiple subjectivities right as individuals who have experienced a whole lot of things which the ethno ethnographer observes or participates and is written through the ethnographer it involves multiple subjectivities and political constraints beyond the control of the writer in response to these forces ethnographic writing enacts a specific strategy of writing so this specific strategy of writing james clifford argues and of course talala sir also argues is nothing but translation um in fact uh, i also argue it's not just i mean i kind of skipped maybe or jumped from uh, how national literatures is constituted by translation to ethnography as translation but i'll i'll try and connect it a little bit uh, but then uh, i also argue that if any act of writing itself right writing of our experience into written words is translation translation is also something that characterizes our thought translation is also something that characterizes our field work it characterizes our listening our observation our note making and the power of our interpretations are and writing right why is this so and this is not my idea this has been uh, uh, talked about by many many people how the act of our listening to somebody else right a word uttered is understood by us in a particular manner it is processed by our mind in a particular manner and when we repeat the same uh, idea to somebody else we are essentially translating and it's not just when we are speaking but what is happening in our mind is also a translation of our experience right what we experience and how we think about it in our minds and how we express it in our words whether spoken or written all these are various layers of translation is which many people have uh, argued for in fact everything that we inhabit and express 
is a translation of our experience. So there is nothing uh, very faithful reproduction of things, but our lives itself are a translation in process. In fact, uh, Octavio Paz expresses this very beautifully uh, and where he says that nothing is original, everything is a translation, but at the same time, everything is also original, right? Because nothing is original, everything can also be understood as original. I, uh, just, uh, yeah, this is the slide, which it's just a, a quote from Octavia Paz, who says, every text is unique. And at the same time, it is the translation of another text. No text is entirely original because language itself in its essence is already a translation, right? Language itself is translation. Firstly, of the non-verbal world, and secondly, since every sign and every phrase is the translation of another sign and another phrase. However, this argument can be turned around without losing any of its validity. All texts are original because every text, every translation is distinctive, right? Every translation is distinctive, even if you translate the same text in the same language. Uh, be it one of the famous examples uh, that is often given is uh, Rabindranath's Gitanjali, Rabindranath Tagore's Gitanjali, which is translated into English so very many times. But each translation is different, even if it, when it is done into the same language, right? Therefore, all texts are original because every translation is distinctive. Every translation up to a certain point is an invention. And as such, it constitutes a unique text, right? So the bottom line is, transla every translation is original and every so-called original is a translation. Now, uh, when you read Foucault alongside this notion, you will understand that this notion of author, authority, right? Authentic, original, this, is, this comes into being in a very, uh, a capitalist world where the authority of the author is kind of reinforced every moment and therefore you have a copyright to the quote unquote original and so on and so forth. Prior to the coming of uh, uh, European modernity or capitalism, this idea of original and translation, this binary between original and translation was not so very clear not just uh, in Europe, but all across the world. So in addition to what Octavia Paz is saying, it is translation that urges us to recognize and work with the interdisciplinarity that is embedded or enmeshed within networks of power. Let me just go to the next slide. Okay. So translation urges us that there is an interdisciplinarity which is inseparable from that of our world, from that of any discipline that we are part of, right? Because translation both in practice and in theory necessarily involves comparison. Now, when you're translating, whether you're just translating two sentences or translating a whole text, or translation as understood as interpretation, representation in theory, inevitably involves comparison. It involves more than one entity, right? Translation essentially involves more than one entity, whether it is language, as I said, or culture or representation. Translation practice is a comparative practice because it's always in multiple. It's not singular, never singular. While translation is largely and popularly understood and conceived as a practice, like as a linguistic practice with certain aspects of culture involved. So translation is popularly conceived as that, but translation is increasingly understood, conceived as a practice, as a practice in relation to 
uh, especially after the coming of post-colonial studies, political discourse, translation is understood as very much essential, right? Uh, which is closely connected to representation. Even if understanding translation as a bridge, now translation is also understood as a bridge that brings two languages and two cultures. This understanding is quite limiting, but this in itself acknowledges the transcultural interdisciplinary act of translating, right? Translation is always a translation of meaning. So any translation, it translates the meaning. So when you translate the meaning, I mean, everything in this world is based on meaning, right? How we understand our world is how we understand or its meaning. And so this essentially makes translation as central to meaning making per se. So when we bring in the idea of translation as representation, the interdisciplinarity of translation is only reinforced because translation not just represents one culture, one society in totally new context, right? When you're translating Aristotle, I mean, all of us read Aristotle in English, but we read Aristotle as if he originally wrote in English. But no, none of us, I assume very few of us here in the Indian context would know Greek and read Aristotle in original. But it is translating one culture, one society, one idea into totally a translating it into a new cultural context, new historical context, and in very, very different languages. And uh, in the post-colonial context, beginning with Edward Said, who showed us the centrality of literary representation and how literary representation consolidated colonialism, right? Literature is not just literature, but literature and language practices and translation essentially consolidated colonialism is what Edward Said uh, showed us. And of course, there are a whole lot of others who have argued this point. And continuing with Talal Asad, who brought to our notice that the play of translation and language of inequalities in anthropological and sociological writings, the notion that all representations, right, whether it is historical, whether it is ethnographical, whether it is literary, all kinds of representations are translations that operate within many powers. Right? Now that this idea that history is a representation of the past, ethnography is a representation of a particular cultural practice. Literature, of course, is a particular representation of uh, literary imagination of a people whom you have encountered, whether you know, partly history, which you have embellished. So whether it's literature, ethnography, history, sociology, all this is a representation which function within a network of power. So essentially, culture is a text, right? <clears throat> any act of culture, any expression of culture is a text. And ethnography is also a type of literature. You write, an individual author writes what he or she observes. And all this is governed by certain conventions and ideas, which is accepted now both largely by literary critics and also anthropologists and historians. While this means we look at ethnography as a narrative, anthropologist as an author, a historian as an author, it simultaneously implies that literature is also expressing a historical cultural experience where all these disciplines are translating the worldly experience, right? What this for me means is that there is a blurring of disciplinary boundaries and this blurring of disciplinary boundaries is made possible by translation, right? I thought I missed something. So <clears throat> this, of course, uh, obviously implies that translation is also a project of nation, empire, and power. Now, this is where I want to connect with the earlier uh, discussion on uh, national literature, national culture, how they are constituted. 
Uh, so if we take the example of how this idea of uh, a singular homogeneous Indian nation state came into being, this making of the Indian nation state, as with all other nations, it relied heavily on the unintended, perhaps intended to collaborative work of the European Orientalists and Indian nationalists, right? So you have a whole lot of European Orientalists in the late 18th and throughout the 19th century, Orientalists who were translating a whole lot of Sanskrit texts. They began with Sanskrit texts, uh, not just uh, Sanskrit literary texts. One of the favorites uh, for the European uh, Orientalists was uh, translating uh, Shakuntala. But they also translated Manusmriti. They also translated a whole lot of other uh, Sanskrit texts. And interestingly, Indian nationalists also contributed in interpreting and even translating these texts. So the idea that this great, quote unquote, Indian national culture could be traced back to 2000 years or more, right? Well, happened through this process of translation, translating transcript texts by bring and making them available to the public, right? So by making this translation available to the public, there are many, many kind of implications that happen. One, that so-called Hindu culture had a very ancient past, a very ancient literature, a very ancient history. Now, how does all this ancient literature and uh, history come into being? It's only via translation. So uh, Indian national literature and Indian national culture was constituted via translation, initially only of uh, uh, Sanskrit texts and gradually other major languages were also included, right? So this translation of trans Sanskrit texts, be it religious, be it political, be it literary, in addition to ethnographical writings, a whole lot of uh, European Orientalists also studied Indian languages and talked about Indian languages and their connection, disconnection, and so on and so forth, thereby gradually constructing a Indian identity, so to speak. Sometimes, of course, in connection to the Indo-Aryan, the European kind of a language that happened with the Indo-Aryan languages and the European languages. But then there was a uh, quote unquote influence of Sanskrit that they understood as connecting all of the subcontinent. So this translation of various texts attempted at connecting disparate people paved way in constituting a body of Indian literature and Indian culture that went on to represent a continuous Indian national high Hindu culture on which the identity of India as a nation was and is built. So this identity of India as a nation, which has had a very continuous identity, is built via translation, right? So it's, and it's, let me tell you that it's not just uh, the Indian nation, but many, in fact, uh, uh, Susan Bassnett, who is one of the foremost uh, translator, uh, practitioners of translation studies, theorists of translation studies, has argued that it's not just in the subcontinent, but also all across Europe, where uh, a modern nation state has emerged, translation has been the significant factor in this making of a modern nation state. Uh, in fact, translation is the only mode the only method that brought different languages, different people together as an imagined one, right? How do we imagine this multifaceted, unequal kind of people together? It is only by translating them. Now, what is interesting and what many others have pointed out as, as you know, is this, that this translation of these various languages, this translation of various cultures and bringing them together has happened largely in English, in the case of India. So although English is not really considered an Indian language, but it is via English that translation has been used as a mode to connect this disparate places and disparate people, language, cultures. 
In fact, uh, Tejaswini Niranjana's uh, seminal books, I think, translation has furthered this clarity on the power of translations representation that aided the colonizer and how the writing up, right? Uh, writing up by which we also mean translation, writing up of field notes into an ethnographical narrative represents the colonized. In these realms of power within which translation operates, the attempt here, my attempt, is also to point to the translation or representation of minoritized people, right? It's not just the relationship between colonized and the colonizer. How is uh, minority people, minority language translated and represented in this uh, realm of history, politics, and nation making? Right, uh, people whose voices and languages are outside the realm of the nation. Right? How is Kasi translated into this nation? Right? Does Kasi constitute anywhere, constitute something in this body of nation making? Uh, which means that this translation acts within a certain kind of power, which operates in certain kind of languages and so on. But then translation also works subversively, right? It's not just that translation is uh, uh, in the hands uh, or is a tool of the powerful, be it colonized or the caste elites or language elites, but it is also a tool which works subversively within the hands, within the realms of the marginalized. Um, one uh, very interesting article is that by Karin Litov, who in her article Pandora's Box points out how translation using the myth of tra Pandora's Box, she points out how translation can enable multiple readings, especially feminist readings of texts and cultures that are transgressive, right? You can basically shake power using multiple meanings via translation. In fact, in the context of India, uh, Rita Kotari argues how the translation of Dalit narratives into English, if you notice most of the Dalit narratives which are written in many languages of India, uh, from uh, Tamil Nadu to Hindi, uh, various languages, Bangla, so on and so forth, all these narratives of Dalit lives written by Dalits are translated into English. Of course, they're translated into other languages, but because precisely because they're translated into English, it circulates in a manner that subverts a very hegemonic idea of what is India, right? Uh, it actually shakes the grounds on which Indian nation is built uh, through translation again. And even here, it is happening via translation. So translation, although used by <clears throat> the powerful as a tool, to construct a particular identity, translation can also be used uh, in pretty much uh, contradictory ways to shape that and build an alternative idea. Uh, and in fact, Rita Kotari points out how these translations of Dalit narratives into English has made possible an archive and has pushed the experiences of caste into a language, into English, that does not have the burden of a memory of caste. Uh, just like the many possibilities of translation, uh, there are many possibilities of translation. And I will end with this quote by uh, S. Shankar, who talks about this many possibilities of translation. Uh, he says, just as with translation as interpretation, it is prudent to keep in mind that comparatism can be a form of knowing in solidarity or else of knowing as domination, right? So translation or comparatism, which can be a double-edged kind of a understanding, a tool, a method that tells us how to build in a solidarity. Of course, it can also aid in a a uh, realm that can be very oppressive as well. So uh, translation, of course, can have multiple interpretations, can be put into uh, multiple uses, ranging from oppression to solidarity. 
I'll end there. And uh, I'm not sure how the question answer session will work, but yeah. Thank you so much, Ariba, and thanks everyone for uh, listening and being here. Thank you, ma'am. Um, all right. Before I actually, you know, uh, go into the question, uh, the uh, the part where we, you know, we ask you some questions. Um, I would just like to add something from my part. Uh, I want to say that you know, uh, this has been a very learning, uh, some, an extremely learning experience for me because I come from a literature background myself, and we tend to think of comparative literature and translation as very isolated in the sense uh, they're their own you know department. So we don't usually think that we have to know anything about them. Usually it becomes like that. I mean that is. Uh, a thought in most of us, I believe, and they're fast becoming extremely relevant and necessary disciplines. And at some point in our lives as research scholars, it is all about comparatism and translation studies. And I feel very pleased that I was able to sit and moderate for this session of yours, ma'am, because um, I think it was it is something I also need to know. This is something I absolutely have needed to know, and it. It, it, it's it's been it's it, it was a great talk so thank you so much for you know your points i mean it was a very basic and essential you know outline of whatever i realized i needed to know so thank you ma'am thank you so much uh there are a few questions that have already popped up on the screen uh, okay uh okay it's not a question i don't know uh relevance of comparative literature today it is the bringing together of various forms of reading and analysis how would you situate complete and translation studies within literature as a whole Ma'am, am I audible? Oh, uh, ma'am, yeah, yeah. I muted. I, I muted. Yeah, yeah, I muted myself. Sorry. Uh, yeah, what I was saying is the point of my talk today was basically a reversal of this question, right? I situated literature within comparative literature and translation studies. I think every literature hmm. is has to be studied in comparison with something else, right? Uh, you're not studying a text in a vacuum. You are studying a text in a certain kind of context. So every literature has to be situated in a comparative and a translation kind of a sphere. So it's not that comparative literature and translation studies have to be situated in literature, but literature has to be situated in the comparative and the translation kind of a framework. I, okay. uh, did I make myself yeah. clear? Or? Thank you, ma'am. I think you're clear, which is something also, I, I think I must have said something about that sometime back. Um, okay, we have another question, I think. Um, Okay, uh, it's not on the screen. All right, can you help me understand how dialogue could be created between uh, comparative literature, translation studies, and other literary disciplines like English? Okay, even I want to know this. <laughs> this is, uh, I mean, I think uh, a question that is not really easy. Uh, uh, because the disciplinary boundaries, this can be addressed in different ways, right? One, uh, at the theoretical level. And of course, uh, in uh, uh, at another level, it's also a disciplinary question, a question of practice. Now, we have uh, drawn these disciplinary boundaries so tight that we refuse to acknowledge that there is a connection. Right? There is a connection between uh, our disciplines, be it uh, Hindi, English, Urdu, or, and comparative literature. Now, once we recognize that there is a connection, 
in fact this is a problem i would say not so much with comparative literature but i would say it's a problem with single language departments single literary literary departments because uh, there is a tendency to see your single language as a very sacrosanct kind of a uh, 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 a sphere uh, let me give an example I, an example which i gave earlier in the talk now we are willing to study aristotle in english literary criticism i don't think any department of english uh, misses out on aristotle correct me if i wrong all english departments will have sure. aristotle sure. as a uh, reading right now how do we read uh, aristotle we cannot understand aristotle unless we understand his writing in a comparative frame of greek and what is happening in his own time and mm. space right and we read aristotle in translation into english now do we know this is what exactly what aristotle meant it would have gone through multiple translations over 2000 years right the moment we acknowledge oh, that exactly. kind of a reading that kind of an understanding i think a dialogue is automatically you know made between different disciplines hmm. now when aristotle is accepted even shakespeare for example all of shakespeare's writings it is known it is proven that he took his stories from a whole lot of places whether it is julius caesar whether it is some other king most of his plays are from various cultures that he imagined and wrote about they're not english english per se so in understanding shakespeare itself there is a whole lot of translation that is going on in his work he has translated the story of julius caesar into a particular kind of english and we are reading it in as something else 500 years later right so we are constantly translating the story of julius caesar not just into english but into so many languages but reading it as oh this is literature written in english by the great shakespeare no that is not you know exactly how it is so once we recognize the context so i think there is you know automatically a dialogue that props up that that's true actually because uh, i remember sitting for one masters uh, class it was a post colonial um, post colonial studies class i think and uh, we were talking about how there are so many different theorists you know from russia from germany from france and across the world that we study you know and uh, i remember sir had said something like do you realize french theorists don't even write about anything beyond france so and why are we applying it you know in our studies today so you're right i mean translation then becomes very important in this regard if we are ever to you know sort of come to a very wholesome study and analysis of whatever literature or different subjects or you know things like that i think we have one more question Uh, the, the, i think i can add a little to that uh, yes when it comes to greek yeah. or french or german theorists we kind of accept it and teach it in our own departments right we do. but it, when it comes to uh, literatures or theories written in various indian languages it is not as accepted as you know or taught in unitary uh, literary literary departments so even there like it's also addressing this question can we see translation as politics yes it is politics because the way you accept aristotle you may not accept uh, sharad kumar limbale or you may not accept uh, another theorist who is questioning uh, dominant indian aesthetics right so mm. even while accepting translations there are certain translations you accept but certain translations you do not because uh, you know a whole lot of uh, not just language politics but power politics also come in comes into play uh, and if i can continue with that question our translation is also politics definitely yes i think that was the point of the talk as well how when uh, you know it, we are constituting an idea of indian literature we are bringing together a body of indian literature uh, from different languages what are the languages that come to be represented in translation as indian literature 
like the early 19th century example i gave you uh, europeans and uh, indian elites as well translated a whole lot of sanskrit texts and said this is indian literature so now the translated sanskrit texts came to be represented as indian literature gradually of course this has changed but even now right if i ask whether kashi comes under this body of indian literature or what is the place of kashmiri language in this body of indian literature are they translated mm-hmm. as much as other languages so of course translation is an act of politics and it's also a product of politics as well i agree i agree we have another question um there is a pattern of the translation of dalit texts which is that they are done mostly by upper caste question is how is this kind of translation works against the transition works against the very idea of breaking of caste uh yeah this is a kind of uh, i think again you can place it uh, in the realm of language politics the languages that are accessible to individuals and communities right there is an aspiration for english from the dalit communities they do aspire for english but the accessibility to english has been not so easy as it is for the upper caste but the desire to be translated the aspiration to learn english to write in english is very much present alongside the desire to be translated from the language they are writing in. so this desire and aspiration i think to be translated into english works in a kind of solidarity that shankar perhaps is talking about right knowing in solidarity as much as knowing in domination so translation works as much in solidarity with certain uh, 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 very problematic platforms questionable platforms like this one how the dalit texts are constantly translated by upper caste people in fact most of the dalit texts we read in english are translated by upper caste people which is a kind of solidarity perhaps which is strategically used by the dalit writers themselves not just is their aspiration to be translated into a language that lacks the memory of caste right it does not have the memory of caste but it is also a strategic tool which is uh, uh used by the dalit writer to be translated to be worked on by somebody else and then pushed into another realm altogether yes ma'am okay um we have another question am i audible yeah i can hear you I I can't hear you now though Ivan Okay Ma'am uh, am I audible Yeah I can hear you now Okay okay so uh all right so there's one statement uh there's one thing that has come up there's this would be from Right I believe even the fact that we study English literature despite being speakers of different languages itself proves the importance of understanding translation as a framework and politics all right uh, is sort of a agreeing statement to what yeah we will discuss uh, uh there's a, another question as translators translating from indian languages into english how can we intervene to bring solidarity uh as readers i'm not sure uh, uh who you are referring to nilima are we referring to we as readers intervening to bring in solidarity or we as translators because translators uh, i mean they might be working in their own context without knowing each other but then as uh, rita kotari i quoted rita kotari they might be working in different contexts but then there is an archive of anti caste literature that has been put together using these translations right so it is an archive although 
unintentionally put together it is an archive that has a very uh, 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 you know anti caste function built into it so i think uh, although happening separately uh, the coming together of english translations of dalit literature itself is an act of solidarity I hope mom has answered your questions. Uh, do we have any more questions? I think that is probably it. So, um, mom, uh, thank you so much for your talk, and I'm sure everyone here will agree when I say that it was a great learning experience to hear Somia mom, you know, talk. Oh, we have one more question. Okay, can a translator change words of phrases to make a work politically correct the translator has such freedom see this question makes sense when we know both languages in the sense if i am reading a kodava poem and then i am translating it you as a uh, let's say telugu reader you are reading the english version and you cannot or do not Uh, access kodava language you are not familiar with kodava language there is no way you know that you know i have remained mm. quote and quote faithful to the text so that is both a beauty of translation and that is what translation makes a text original right unless a reader can read both the languages involved it doesn't matter at all even when you read both the both the languages it doesn't matter because as i said geetanjali which has been translated into english many many times and each time the translation is different right so it is a accepted thing that translators do use various strategies take various freedoms with their translation and that is why the translation of a single text can vary from person to person all right i hope that answer your yeah. question mam this has been and i i have to say this again and again because i don't want you to forget it but <laughs> i've learned so much from this talk <laughs> and i'm so happy to have you know hosted you today and i'm sure everyone here will agree that we all learned a lot and I I won't even read from the script that I had prepared anymore. I just have to thank you so much on behalf of S and all the people who watched this. It was one of the more uh, it was was one of the most um informative and enlightening talks so far. And because I come from a literature background, this is really important for me and I'm sure everybody will agree as well. So I we come to the end of the talk this evening and uh before we sign off i would like to thank ariba the president of ais for conceptualizing realizing and bringing to fruition this lecture i also um, extend our gratitude to you ma'am and all the members who have worked tirelessly to make this event possible uh, with special mention of aruna anil kumar ajab rangoon wala and manasa we at ais are grateful for the support enthusiasm and determination of the speaker the participant and our team here at as so thank you ma'am and have a great evening ahead everybody else as well thank you so much for participating and i hope you all have a great evening we'll see you at our next lecture which will probably be on the 31st of this month and i'll be hosting you then as well so thank you guys and thank, thank you, you thank you so much ivan and thanks ariba and everyone there at as it was my pleasure uh but i i'm hoping the next time i'll also get to see the audience that is much more uh, pleasurable experience is what i have felt than <laughs> staring at the screen thank you so much ivan <laughs> hopefully we'll meet on campus soon ma'am you most welcome thank you we'll meet soon after all of us are vaccinated and healthy mm. and yeah take care ma'am much love you to too. you and your family thank you same there take care Bye. Yes, ma'am. Bye.